Hello everyone, this is John Buck back with another Discrete Time Linear Systems video. Uh, and in this video we're going to talk about filtering, reviewing some properties between time and frequency, and specifically talking about when we think about frequency response as a complex function in terms of its magnitude and its phase, how the magnitude tells us what happens vertically to the signal, which frequencies get uh, amplified, uh, which get attenuated, and which get left alone. And then phase is about what's going on left to right, so that how each frequency is shifted in time uh, relative to the other frequencies. So let's see how that works out. Again, topic for today is looking at filtering and particularly the magnitude and phase of the frequency response. In this class, we're going to worry first and most about the magnitude response, because the magnitude response tells us for each frequency uh, whether it survives getting through the filter or not. And, and that's the most important thing. If, if, so, if something gets removed by a filter, we don't care much about the phase, which tells us when it would have been there, right? So magnitude is about whether things get through the filter or not. Uh, only after they get through the filter do we worry about how they are treated in the time, like how much they're shifted in time by doing that. Okay, so if we look at this, you know, filtering, we know in the time domain we've seen already, if I have an LTI filter, the output of the filter is the input signal here uh, convolved with the frequency response. And uh, important property we've seen is if I'm convolving in time, what's happening in frequency? So pause the video for a second, think to yourself, okay, and now you're back. It, hopefully what you, you remember that convolving in time is the same as, as multiplying in frequency, right? That y of e to the j omega is the result of multiplying h of e to the j omega with x of e to the j omega. And in fact, if uh, we need reminding of that, we can always go uh, back here to our uh, My First Transform blocks, right? Again, made by uh, Fourier Price and available wherever finer nerd toys are sold. But I have my uh, my time domain. Let me get in front of my face because then it will focus on the block instead of me. There we go. So if I'm convolving in time, I'm multiplying in frequency, right? I have y of e to the j omega is x of e to the j omega times h of e to the j omega. And again, the conceptual idea, again, convolve in time is multiply in frequency. Okay, so there's my uh, my Fourier block just to remind us we uh, get back to the whiteboard here and so in general we've seen free Fourier transforms are complex functions and so if I have a complex function I can think of it in real and imaginary parts but I can also more usefully think of it when I'm filtering as magnitude and phase so again when I'm filtering magnitude and phase is the more useful representation so I can write y in terms of magnitude of y and e to the j phase similarly for h and x and so now if we take this equation up here and put those in, right, so I'm going to plug this in for y, I plug this in for y, this in for h, and that in for x. When I do that, what I'll get down here is that I'll have y of e to the j omega is equal to magnitude of y. I'm going to leave out the omegas for now just because I'm, I'm going to run out of room if I don't. All of these things are still functions of e to the j omega. But I'm going to make that implicit for now, I just so I have room to fit everything on the line. The h becomes magnitude of h times e to the j phase of h, and then I have magnitude of x times e to the j magnitude of x. Right? Again, all these functions of omega. And so now I want to say, well, how does how does the magnitude of y depend on the other magnitudes and the phases? So if I group these things together. I can get magnitude of h times magnitude of x. And then if I have two exponentials multiplied together, I can add their exponents. So I get e to the j magnitude of phase, or magnitude of x, or phase of x. I'm sorry, let me back up and say it. I get e to the j phase of x plus phase of h together. So now if I want to match up the two sides of this equation, Right? The magnitude of y is the product of the magnitude of h and x. And meanwhile, the phase of y is the sum of the phases. So I guess I could use those colors to bring them down here. So when I filter with an LTI system, the Fourier transform magnitude of the output is the, Fourier, the magnitude of the frequency response times the magnitude of the input Fourier transform. 
And for the phase, the phase response, the phase of the output Fourier transform is the phase response of the frequency response added to the phase, the, Fourier, the phase of the Fourier transform of the input. So again, the first one, as I said in the intro, is what we'll focus on more. And what this is saying, remember, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is telling me how much of each frequency is there in the signal. So how much of each frequency is present in the input? Then I'm multiplying at each frequency, one frequency at a time. I multiply by the frequency response at that same frequency to find how much the output will be there. So I can worry the frequency response tells me one frequency at a time. Do, does, do I take what's in the input and leave it alone if I have a gain of one? If I have a gain of zero, it says I remove it, right? Multiplying by zero means the output will be zero. If the magnitude of h is more than one, it says I actually take that frequency and amplify it. Right? So that's a very important idea of, of, of what's going on with the magnitude. The phases say whatever time things were at at the input, I'm going to shift them by that phase. And again, phases about, of, of any sinusoid is about left to right. Like where is the time origin? Where am I shifting it relative to the other frequencies? But again, we're going to mainly focus on the blue thing here, the magnitude. But let's see how this plays out if I think about magnitude and phase applied to a simple uh, cosine as an input. So if I have a single input, x of n is just a to the uh, cosine omega naught n. And actually, let's just let's add some phase to that to make sure we get the whole picture here. Let's see how the phases get changed. And so this has some initial phase phi for this cosine. If we want to process it using uh, the eigenfunction property for complex exponentials, our first step is to break this into two pieces using Euler's relation. And when I do that, I'll get e to the j uh, omega naught n uh, plus phi and a over 2 e to the minus j omega naught n. Uh, and actually, I'm going to break these out now. I should have done it on the first one, too. So I'm going to take the phase, distribute the j across, and take the phase out to make it clear what's the exponential and what's just the complex constant, right? Because this piece now, this e to the j phi, e to the minus j phi, they don't depend on n, right? So this piece here is my exponential in terms of my eigenfunction. I can think of it like that, right? So it's e to the j omega raised to the power n. So from that, we know that when I have an exponential input like this, my output will be h of e to the j omega. And I'm going to write that in polar form now. So I have magnitude of h of e to the j omega times the phase of h of e to the j omega naught uh, times e to the j phi times e to the j omega naught n. So that's the first term. Second term, I get similar thing, a over 2. But now I'm doing everything at minus omega naught. So I have the magnitude of the frequency response at minus omega naught. At, um, oh, getting ahead of myself. At minus omega naught for the phase. I have e to the minus j phi and e to the minus j omega naught to the n. I write it like this to remind me of the exponential. And now here's where I use a few of my other Fourier transform properties. That's if h of n is real, then the magnitude of h of e to the j omega naught is an even function. So that h of e to the j omega naught and minus h of e to the j omega naught have the same magnitude, but the phase is odd. So that says that the phase have, um, the phase at minus omega naught will be equal to the negative of the phase at h of e to the j omega naught. Right, so the, the magnitude is even, the phase is odd when, when the impulse response is a real function. So again, this is another benefit Another place where we're, we're taking advantage of those symmetry properties that seem you know, just a little bit like silly mathematical trivial pursuit at first, but they do have, have practical application because once I do that, I can substitute these back in, right? I can put this in, this whole equation in here, and similarly, I can replace the phase 
with this to get the whole thing in terms of common terms. And let's see how that goes. I get an a over 2. And I keep my magnitude of h of e to the j omega naught here. I get still the same uh, phase of h of e to the j omega naught. I have the original phase of the signal and then my exponential. But the second term, some things change now. I say, well, I've got the evenness of the magnitude lets me write this e to the h of magnitude of h of e to the minus j omega naught. Because it's an even function, I can say that's the same as the positive frequency. But the phase part flips. Right? I can say the phase of e to the minus j omega naught of h of e to the minus j omega naught is minus the phase of e to the plus j omega naught. Uh, again, times e to the minus j phi e to the minus j omega naught n. So all this is setting me up for the payoff because now when I look at this, I'm going to uh, put some terms back together here. I'm going to recombine the, the uh, phases. I'll have the magnitude of the frequency response out front. I'm going to combine all these exponentials back together uh, after first you know, sort of distributing or using the exponent property to say I'm going to put that back into a single exponential. And when I do that, I'll have e to the j omega naught n plus phi plus the phase of the frequency response at omega naught. For the first term, wait for it, here comes the good part. On the second term, again, I have the same magnitude because it was even. And now when I put all these back together, I have e to the minus j omega naught n. So if I pull that minus sign out front, this minus phi becomes plus phi inside. And similarly, this minus h of e to the j omega becomes plus h of e to the j omega naught. And so let's pause and step back. If we look at this, what's going on is to say, oh, now I have some constant in front times e to the j something and e to the minus j of the same something. So I can take the halves with this to get back to, again, pause for vi the video for a minute and think. If I have e to the j something e to the minus j something, add them together, what do I get for Euler's? I'll pause the video, I'll, I'll wait for a second while you pause the video and think. Right, it comes back, okay, everyone back. It's, uh, if I bring the halves with it, that becomes a cosine, right? I'm using our old, old friend from Euler, that e to the j x, one half e to the j x plus one half e to the minus j x is equal to cos of x. Right, so using that here and bringing these one halves with me, I end up that I have a times the magnitude of the frequency response at omega naught times the cosine of omega naught n plus phi plus the phase of the frequency response. I'm going to clean my little scrap paper Euler's out of the way here. Now plus, you know, the phase, the original phase has a phase added to it that is the phase of the frequency response at this frequency omega oh naught. So again, what we see going through the signal, sort of reinforcing our intuition, right, uh, that is that the magnitude at the frequency tells me how much gain gets applied, right? The, ma the amplitude of the cosine gets scaled up by the magnitude of the frequency response, and the phase of the cosine gets uh, shifted by the phase of the frequency response. So again, this, let me uh, pull back my video one more time. Again, the mag this is helpful to think about. In fact, I, I encourage you to do it along with me because if you get muscles involved, you'll build stronger memories than just that. The magnitude is about the gain. So move your hands up and down and say the magnitude of the frequency response tells me the gain. The phase of the frequency response tells me the shift left to right. So do that a few times and strengthen that memory about what the meaning of magnitude of frequency response and phase of frequency response is. Okay, and I think uh, that was all I had planned for this video. Yep, so we're done. So uh, just to finish up again, this is uh, uh, the main point for today. Magnitude of the frequency response tells me how much gain the filter applies at each frequency. The phase of the filter frequency response tells me how much it's shifting things left and right. But if you're going to worry about one of them, worry about the magnitude first. Magnitude is most important. 
to let me know does the frequ frequency come through unchanged, does it get amplified, or does it actually get squished down to nothing, right? When the frequency response magnitude is zero, that frequency is removed from the signal. Okay, so that's all for this time. Uh, next time we'll start talking about uh, how, you know, we've been talking about these frequency responses in general. How do we build practical systems to make filters? How do I make a practical system that can do low-pass filtering? That's what we'll start talking about in the next filter. Uh, filter. Ah, next video. All right, have, have a good time, and I'll catch you in the next video.